Thank you. Um, Senior, I think we are still waiting for quite a few people to join us, isn't it? Uh, yes, ma'am. We can wait one or two minutes for them to join us. So while we do that, uh, let's have cameras on for everybody, whoever's here. And um, what I'm going to ask everybody to do, since this is a mental health session, I'd like you all to put in a check-in word in the chat box and let me know where's your mental health at today, right now, before we enter this, uh, enter this session. Uh, uh, try not to use thinking words. Try to use emotional words. What's the first thing? Don't think too much. And uh, I invite all of you to participate in this because I know that this is a virtual class, but um, sinking in. Okay, let's get some let's get some check-in words, everyone. For those of you who are joining us, calm. That's always great to read. Demotivated. I'm sorry to hear that. Sad. Okay. What else? Let's get let's get a pulse on the finger of. Uh, I mean, let's get a finger on the pulse of this room. There's quite a few people here who are still uh, who are well whose names are here. I don't know if you're here because the cameras are off and there are no check-in words. Um, Arti, Shruti. Shake, Arya, Sai. I'm going to ask you all to, to uh, I'm going to encourage you to participate. Okay, this is not a. Um, this is by this is not going to reflect on the quality of of the evaluation or anything. I just I'm just doing a quick round of checks. All right. I'm just wondering if uh, some of the folks are here, like. If you could just turn your cameras on for a couple of seconds, that'll be great, please. Ah, hi, Sinead. <laughs> Good to see you. more people logging in now. Okay, so um, let's just get going then. Why, why are we doing a session on mental health in palliative care? And uh, why, is that, why is it necessary for us to... Uh, great, nice to see you, Shruti. Um, why is it necessary for us to pay attention to this particular topic today as um, as a part of this this foundation pro program i know some of you are trained as counselors some of you have some training in mental health but where do you see the the convergence of mental health and palliative care coming in feel free to use the chat box if you're feeling too shy to unmute I think people have had a particularly good lunch or something today. That can be the only explanation, no, Senior? No idea. <laughs> Mental, okay. Power of total pain. Thanks, Sinead. Mental health impacts everything else, how you deal with diagnosis, prognosis, how you deal with loved ones and others. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, so let's uh, let's get into it. Um, okay. So, is my screen visible? Yes, ma'am. All right, great. 
So I just want to acknowledge um, one of my teachers, Isabel Paul, Dr. Isabel Paul, who uh, very uh, generously did some of this research and put these a majority of these the content together. And uh, she's an experienced uh, mental health uh, practitioner. Um, and and then I adapted it to the palliative care setting, and uh, that's what we're presenting today. So I'd just like to give my thanks to Isabel for really uh, putting the, the the whole you know the chunk of this together and allowing us to then share it with all of you. Okay. Um, okay. So I'm also uh, I'm also oh, it's raining heavily and. Zarna, you work at Happy Feet and you said conversation and listening ability is so important when working with children and that applies to everybody. Thank you. So, um, first off, let's make a very clear distinction. What is a disease? A disease is an abnormal condition affecting an organism requiring treatment. And a disease could include infections, it could include tissue damage or degeneration, trauma, injury, toxic exposure. That's a disease. Is a disease different from illness? What is illness? If this is disease, then what is illness? Anybody? Is there a difference between illness and disease? It's little. Yes, somebody is speaking up, Sheetal. Uh, it is more than just the physical part. Maybe disease refers to just the physical part. But when we are talking about illness, it is a little bit more beyond just the physical aspect of it. So it can be a little bit more than what we see, what meets the eye. Okay, cool. That's a, that's a, that's, that's, that's a great uh, explanation. You're not too far off. Illness, is, illness refers to the emotions, the distress, the discomfort, the fatigue, the weakness, the dysfunction pain, all of that which is associated with the disease. So the disease is the actual diagnosis and the condition that is affecting the organism and the illness is everything that is a result of it. So emotional distress and uh, the fatigue and all of those things that different people feel different things depending on the kind of disease it is. Now, disease usually causes illness. Okay. So if you are Diagnosed with the disease, there's a likelihood of an illness that a constellation of things that you feel around that disease. But sometimes a person with a disease may not experience illness. For example, if you have high blood pressure and if you're managing it well with medication and things, are you going to be feeling sad about your high blood pressure? And are you going to be feeling all these other things? It's going to be well managed if you're taking the right kind of medication, right? Early stages of cancer, why is it that so many people present late? Because they only become symptomatic that late. And so the cancer might be existing in the body for a while before it becomes uncomfortable enough for somebody to go and get it checked and get diagnosed with having the disease. Yeah. So sometimes um, you can have the disease and it may not manifest as an illness till such a time as you get a clear diagnosis off of it. And illness can be managed uh, illness can be managed um, that is the hope Ashley uh, but uh, very often what happens is we pay more attention to the disease and uh, a lot less attention is given to the illness aspects okay there are some illnesses that are experienced without a diagnosed disease and we call them somatoform disorders those of you who have studied psychology and are psychologists and counselors you might know this yeah uh, how many times have you heard somebody say, oh God, that's just psychosomatic. This woman is always complaining. <laughs> it's so psychosomatic. And uh, what that means, people almost say it in a way that is, uh, you know, it's, it's like contempt that there's no real disease. You know, simply this, she's constantly complaining about this. It's just psychosomatic. It's in her head. Now, that's, sort of lends itself to the idea that maybe the body and the mind are not connected, which how many of you agree that the body and mind exist entirely separately from one another? No. Okay. So there might be times when the disease is not diagnosed or diagnosable and the person is feeling all of these things. They're not being able to function. They're not being able to uh, do what they normally are able to do. 
uh, they might have depression, they might have all kinds of things, and there is no real cause for it or a tangible cause for it. It's called a somatoform disorder. Please understand that this is a topic of hot debate across the world, including amongst psychologists and psychiatrists. Okay, but um, I'm personally of the opinion that what happens in the mind and body affects one another. And uh, there's a huge, uh, I mean, there's this incredible, well, it's not new science, but maybe it's gaining more traction now of how your gut is your second mind. In fact, a lot of your emotions emerge in your gut and the gut biome is so important. So there is a huge connection between the body and the mind. And we, uh, human beings have only understood medicine properly for the last, I would say 70, 80 years. And uh, so there's a lot we don't yet understand. Okay, now some, and while the disease causes the illness or the illness might exist by itself, the illness certainly impacts the disease. Now, suppose you have cancer, you have a, you've been given a diagnosis of cancer and all the attending emotions of, of despair, of anger, of sadness, of panic, all of those things come in. Then you're going through chemotherapy. The chemotherapy is giving you side effects like uh, fatigue, vomiting, nausea, all of those things. And um, that is in turn going to affect the disease, right? Now, for some people, just the going to the hospital, standing in line, getting that token, going to get your test done, waiting for your test results, that's causing stress. And that is going to affect your body. It may just have an effect on the disease itself. Yeah, the insomnia, you're not sleeping well. It's going to impact the disease. You're going to get weaker. Um, uh, for some people, you know, who might be in denial of it and are not taking care of themselves and not taking their medication, the disease is getting worse. So the illness does impact the disease and your mental health definitely impacts the way you cope with the disease and you cope with the illness, okay? So Eric J. Cassell, he said that disease is something that an organ has, illness is something a man has. Uh, I'll forgive him for saying man because he said this in 1978, uh, but yeah, an illness is something a person has, okay? So we, as practitioners, and interdisciplinary practitioners especially, we have to address the disease and the illness, okay, not just the disease. And unfortunately, a lot of the times what happens is that so much attention is given to the, to the disease aspect, okay, what medication, what treatment, what surgery, that the illness aspect is uh, forgotten about. And this is where someone said it's part of total pain. So as palliative care providers, we are looking at the illness aspect as well as the disease. Now, what influences psychological responses when somebody is unwell or somebody has been given a serious illness diagnosis? What are some of the influences? Let's get started off, okay? Developmental issues. The, uh, the developmental trajectory of the person, okay? Uh, is the person able to understand what is going on with them? Uh, is the person of an age where they're able to comprehend uh, the, the illness or the disease or what it means. What is the meaning of having a serious illness? Okay. Um, some, uh, it, it could also just be like biological development. Okay. Chronological development. How, how old are they? How, how much are they, are they able to understand and grasp? Now, meaning and impact of the illness. Now, I am the breadwinner of the family. My salary takes care of my household. I have been diagnosed with cancer. Okay. That is the impact. So the, the disease is going to impact not just my physical health, but it is going to impact my family's lifestyle. It's going to impact my income. It's going to affect every aspect of my family's life. Therefore, my psychological responses are also equally impacted. If I am, not to say that somebody who is not the breadwinner and all, it's less impact. There are different kinds of impact. I am the mother. Uh, I have two very young children. And now I've been diagnosed with a serious illness uh, where I'm, maybe it's a progressive neurological condition. Yeah. I'm not going to be able to pick up my children in a little while. I might not be able to speak with them. I may not be able to communicate with them that is also going to impact me and it's going to have a terror it's going to have a, a humongous impact on the way i uh, respond psychologically what is my coping style what are some of your coping styles let me let me ask 
when you guys are stressed out, how do you cope? Some people might go for a some people might go for a run. Huh? Some people might eat yummy too. Lakshana, I and I eat when I'm stressed out. And unfortunately, it's, it's, a, it's a terrible coping mechanism. Sleep, Shahid. I wish I could sleep. Okay, uh, Sarah also sleeps. Um, what? Are, okay, so these are things that you do. Okay, now how do you? Now there's a problem. How do you solve the problem? How do you approach problem solving? Do you rely on other people? Do you want to solve the problem yourself? Are there people in your support system that you will reach out to? Is there somebody in your family who you particularly want to go and get their advice? Uh, are there uh, books that you read or are you somebody who will go and do literature, you know, review and go and see what, what, what is Google going to tell me now? What are some of the ways in which you cope with a crisis or with a stressful situation? Get advice from a trusted person, yeah. Get well informed. Talk to you about it. Inform yourself. Okay. Yeah. And that, to a large extent, will determine your psychological response to the problem that you have on hand. So similarly, different ones you mentioned based on circumstances, correct? Yeah. So um, now some of these coping mechanisms can backfire. I may be someone who thinks, you know what, I'm not going to waste time asking other people for help. I'm going to go and figure it out on my own. And I'm going to go into it with my own biases. I'm going to go into it with my own experiences. I'm going to go into it with my own preconceived notions. I'm going to be burnt out. I want to do everything by myself. I want to control the situation. And next thing you know, it's not working. Um, there are people who just, you know, in a crisis situation, they just, they, they can't handle it. They, they, they have decision paralysis. They expect somebody else to come in and take, take the decisions for them. Yeah. Um, a lot of doctors here will tell you that Googling is probably not the best coping mechanism because it comes back to doctors too. You know, Dr. Google told me that this particular treatment is actually better than what you have prescribed. And so, I mean, I think uh, every doctor here understands the distress that Dr. Google can bring into a situation as a coping mechanism. So um, share with a close friend, share your fears, share your, share your uh, ideas, your thoughts. Yeah, so depending on the kind of social su support you have, depending on the kind of resources available to you, that will determine your coping style and that will determine your psychological response to the illness. Impact on the sense of self. I am suddenly, uh, okay, great. So I have this condition now, uh, which uh, one of the first things it's going to do is prevent me from driving my own car. What does that mean? My independence is gone. I'm no longer allowed to operate an automobile. Yeah. Uh, this disease is affecting me in a way that my concentration levels and my energy levels are affected. I'm not able to go through my routine in the way that I used to be able to do. I'm a teacher. Today, I don't have the energy at three o'clock to come and teach a class on mental health. I'm not so, so I'm not a great teacher today. And uh, that, that, that impact on my sense of self is going to affect me psychologically. Okay. So things like that. How is the how is the disease impacting on your sense of self? Oh my God, I used to be so good at this. Now I can't do this. My identity was that I am this, you know, the, the person in the house who whips up great meals for everybody and I'm constantly hosting people and I can't do it anymore. So all of those things impact on my sense of self. Identity is affected, yes. Relationships. Who are the people in my life? when I get diagnosed with a serious illness? What kind of relationships am I in? Supportive relationships, not so supportive relationships. I told you so relationships, conflicted relationships. And I've said this before, dysfunction will only be enhanced. Unless the family actively seeks help, which very rarely happens. The, the, the kinds of personalities, the kinds of clashes, the kinds of, conflict that existed in a family prior to the diagnosis 
will only be enhanced in a majority of cases. If the family is cohesive, if they're used to leaning on one another, problem solving together, chances are the psychological responses will be better. Okay? So, stressors, other stressors. What are some of the other stressors that people experience when there is a sudden diagnosis of an illness or in the trajectory of an illness? Okay, I've already got the diagnosis. I've been living with this disease now for three months, four months. Now, what are the stressors? What are some of the other stressors that a person who is living with an illness likely to experience? The limitations that it brings along, whatever we are going through, limitations in all forms, the way we work, like you mentioned, financial Hmm. spendings become more just on the health part on one individual and if you're not earning and spending it's a very bad ratio yeah it's a terrible ratio. friend circle probably somebody says oh that is like you know it's it's contagious so not to visit social circle decreases depending yeah. on what disease you have been diagnosed with and how your mental condition is after that sure. so the limitations come along fantastic thank you Pat. Anybody else? Financial complete change in job, in role, yeah. Who's going to take care of the children if I'm going to be taking care of the patient all the time? Yeah, yeah. I'm exhausted. The medication, whatever, the, the chemotherapy is making this person so weak and sick and they need constant attention and care. I, I'm not getting any time to sleep myself. Um, stressors like extended family constantly giving me advice. That's a stressor. It can be a stressor. Don't go to this doctor. Go to that doctor. This doctor is rubbish. You know, go to my uncle's homeopath. Um, so constant unsolicited advice other stressors could be just the distance from say you know i have to go to the office but i have an appointment doctor's appointment so i have to go back home pick up the patient go to the hospital come back drop the patient come back to my office these are stressors these are all stressors okay loneliness and isolation thank you nancy very very important and everyday tasks uh, the climate can be a terrible stressor. And yes, it can be because uh, stressors like, okay, you know, like recently, um, I'll give an example. Um, my mother was on constant oxygen support and uh, we didn't really need the cylinders. At first we needed the concentrator, but the concentrator ran on electricity. The load shedding every day became a stressor. I had to get an additional backup only for the concentrator so that the concentrator wouldn't stop. But if the load shedding exceeded three hours, the backup would fail. That was a constant stressor. And so that's when I got the cylinders. And then, then anyway, her, her you know, volume of oxygen support went up. But things like that can be terrible stressors. Medication that you're ordering not coming in time. Um, uh, stressors like, you know, even something like transferring a person to a car to take them to, to a hospital is a stressor. So, spiritual resources. What are my spiritual resources? For some people, it's prayer. For some people, it's faith, going to church. That's part of it. For some people, it might be sitting and writing. For some people, it might be uh, listening to music. For some people, it might be just spending time in the company of friends. Some people, it might be you know meditating, painting, art, whatever. I don't have time for that. I don't have time to replenish myself internally, spiritually, in order to be able to face my disease. You know, earlier I used to meditate five times, uh, I mean, whatever, five minutes a day or fifteen minutes a day. Now I'm so groggy with the medication, I can't do it. And that's what used to actually bring me peace and calm. And allow me to be resilient. You know, so resilience building practices that come through our spiritual resources are also spiritual resources, and those are diminished. Economic circumstances, I mean, this seems so obvious now, economic circumstances, but this doesn't mean that the poorer you are, the worse it is. 
people who are affluent also have a different kind of uh, they have they have they have their own constellation of issues to deal with. Yeah, uh, high end high tech hospitals prescribing all. Hey, why don't you try this new medication? You know, it's experimental. You can give it a shot. It's going to cost so much, but then you might have a shot at, and then you have to make that decision. And those decisions have psychological impact. Yeah. Uh, it's not the very impoverished who end up in ICUs for weeks and months on end. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So economic circumstances will bring with it different kinds of stressors, will bring with it different kinds of psychological responses. Okay. Relationships with healthcare providers, this is a very important one. This is a very important one. You might have the best doctor in the world on the country but if the man can't talk to you apart from in monosyllables how are you going to feel about it i'm not you know i, I there are i know i have i have patients i have spoken with patients who have told me that you know talking to this doctor makes me feel like i'm a waste of time like i'm i'm stupid like i'm asking stupid questions uh and then i don't want to ask the question he, I know he's a great doctor. Everyone tells me he's a great doctor, but he, he doesn't even have a con. It's been six months he's been treating me. We haven't had one conversation. So what, do I not matter enough? I'm not allowed to ask these questions. Am I being stupid? And then he scolds me if I'm going to go and check online about something. I have also heard the other side where, you know, patients have come to realize that maybe their illnesses are terminal or they're not going to get better. But the way in which the doctor or the nurse or the healthcare provider has expressed the news to them, has, has supported them, has made all the difference and has allowed them to face the disease with that much more strength and clarity and information. So the relationship with the healthcare provider is very, very important. And I think that cannot be, uh, I cannot emphasize that uh, enough. Okay. So here's something called a distress thermometer. You might find it useful. Um, you can just Google it. I'm asking you to Google it. But um, the distress thermometer is basically, um, you know, well, it's it, it's a way of checking how stressed out your patient is. Okay. Now you can actually adapt this to however you want it. But typically, you know, uh, no distress to extreme distress. Um, and you get them to score, right? So we go through practical problems. How are you feeling about childcare? Yeah, do you have somebody to look after the children at home while you're going and getting all your treatments and interventions? Um, are you being able to pay rent? Do you own your own house, or are you having to now? You know, is your rent something that is becoming unaffordable? Do you have insurance? Is your insurance covering this disease uh, treatment, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? Then there are family issues, there are emotional issues, social issues. And basically what you end up doing is you, you, the number of, you, you add up yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, and that gives you a score. And that pretty much tells you how far up the distress ladder these guys are. And uh, why, do, why do we need this? I mean, it's kind of obvious that somebody who's got a serious illness is going to be distressed, right? What is this thermometer doing for me that, that makes it relevant? It's, it's giving you a standard view, like, you know, because otherwise it's a very biased kind of a topic. But like in Hindi, we say like, you know, the horns, uh, the horns of a cow are horn, um, bell ko bell ka sing bhari or gai ko gai ka sing bhari, as they call it. Okay. No. So you don't know, you, you, you can't relate or you need to have a standard to which you can compare and you can fix and you can check where you stand. That's one, okay. yeah. That's one way of looking at it. Anything else? Anybody else? Adding a value actually helps us reflect back on it. Like, let's say after a while you check your distress and you can compare with how you felt before, see whether it's improving or it's worsening, and accordingly you can provide help. Excellent, Nancy. That's it. Gives us baseline also. Yeah, it gives us baseline and gives us something to come back to compare to. The other thing I want to tell, probably mention is we sometimes assume that the distress is about something when it's actually something else. Okay. I might think that my patient is distressed because of, oh my God, this is like a terribly serious illness. 
but they might actually be worried about this part, work in school. My children are not doing well in school because they're so worried about me. Maybe that's the thing that's causing them the most amount of distress. And what can I do then? I can, I, I, can, I can come into that area and actually, you know, explore that area better. So it takes away assumption, one. Two, there are things here that we may not think about. Or it helps us pinpoint things that might be a source of actual uh, stress to the patient. Yeah. Um, so, so this is, uh, and everyone's situation is unique. Everyone's sense of distress is unique. Yeah. And how much self awareness? Excellent. So, see, um, I'm. If if someone's, why is it important to have a therapist? I, I mean, this is why, right? Why do you have a counselor? Why do you have a lawyer? Why do you have a doctor? It's because they are the experts in that sense. Now, here by going through this, uh, it's also giving me back the vocabulary of what I'm stressed out about. Things that I may not have been able to articulate. Because we're great at saying, ha, I see, you know, uh, in Tamil here, like if I ask somebody who's not feeling well, like, you know, I'm like that. Like, nothing has changed. But I don't know the specifics of that. So now this gives me specifics and then I'm able to tackle things one at a time. Okay, now I'm going to talk to you about the window of tolerance. Uh, how many of you have heard of this? concept of a window of tolerance anybody i'm just going to stop sharing the screen ashley okay anybody else okay no you can use the thumbs up reaction button okay one person ashley it's up to you and i too Okay, Shanice, thanks. It's up to you and I to um, by the term tolerance means sensual tolerance. What is the limit that you can bear to? I mean, just going by lame layman's understanding. So tolerating, how much can you tolerate? How much can you take? Yeah. Yeah. That's, okay, that's a start. So this is a this is a framework. Okay, it's a theoretical framework which um I'm offering to you as a way of somehow you know you this is where you can place the amount of distress that the person is in now you've done the distress thermometer you know what is upsetting them what is the frequency of what is this so you have to use your expertise at that point now they're telling you that they're worried about their children not doing well in school now you have to apply your expertise to say okay what makes you think that or what makes you think that your child needs more attention do i need to go to the school and have a chat with them is the school aware that the child the child has a parent who's going through a serious illness and what's going on at home, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's where your expertise comes in. The window of tolerance is to really see where that person is at and, uh, you know, and what the risks are to that person at that point. Now, let me just go back to the screen. Here's a window of tolerance. Now, I want you to first of all focus on this gray area in the middle. And think of it as this, these are the boundaries, the upper and lower limit within which when you're functioning, you are able to feel safe, relatively calm, you're able to make fairly, you know, well thought out decisions uh, and, and uh, execute, you know, problem solving skills, things like that. You're generally at your most grounded, okay? All of us in the course of a day will have mood, um, changes and so on but by and large we're functional we're able to tackle our day we're able to be fairly sensible about life now and these spikes and lows that you see are typical like i said these are changes in your day in your week or so on and so forth i just imagine this spike here being the diagnosis of a serious illness okay and for most of us on receiving news like that. Any one of these things can manifest. Anxiety, hypervigilance, stress, you know, I mean, it's, this is a feeling, feeling of being threatened. Okay, my safety is at threat, my health is at threat, my life is at threat. And um, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a, it's, your sympathetic nervous system is getting activated. 
uh, not everybody feels hostility, rage, and impulsive. But I'm saying that typically these are the sort of emotional uh, responses that come up: panic, uh, fear, things like that. Um, when we uh, now imagine on a regular work day, regular work day, you've hit a crisis at work. Okay, an unexpected crisis. You've gone into this. You know, you were supposed to, some some team member of yours was supposed to help you out with something to meet a deadline. They have, you know, they've let you down. So you might be feeling a little bit of anger and then you're panicked and you're then now hypervigilant. Where is the boss? Is she coming? Is she going to, you know, is she going to uh, pull me up for this, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And anyway, you managed to finish the task. Typically after that, there is a period of decline. The adrenaline, the adrenaline crash has gone. I um, mean, sorry, there's an adrenaline crash and people tend to feel, oh, God, that is difficult. Exhaustion, a little bit of numbness, maybe a little bit of, you know, just unwinding. And then for some people, even feeling a bit disassociated. Now, uh, this is hypo arousal. Okay. And now you really, now you've gone through this really difficult day and uh, someone says, hey, the neighbors want to come over to you know, meet you for a little while. You don't. You don't want to socialize with anybody. You're, you're just generally avoidant of any further activity that might need your uh, engagement in that sense. Now, as and when you have more and more crisis situations, you tend to spend more and more time in these spaces. The longevity of each of these, like you might feel anxious for longer. Okay, the lows are a little bit lower. You're more exhausted. There's a little bit more fatigue. Okay, and then one more crisis, and then one more crisis. So then this oscillation starts getting more and more um, severe. And you start spending less and less time in your window of tolerance. So as you live through a crisis, you will find that your decision-making ability might get impaired. You're tired all the time. You're irritable. You're, you know, you're snapping at people. You're not being able to do the things, I mean, be calm about how you're handling things. So this is where the oscillations, like a pendulum, they get more and more severe and you end up spending more and more time in each of these. Your job as a care provider is to, and is to try and bring this person back here into this gray zone, okay? And stress and trauma can shrink this window. Over a period of time, as you spend less and less time here, it becomes a smaller and smaller. You are less tolerant of things. So like Sheetal said, it's my tolerance level. What am, I, what am I tolerant of? That starts to shrink. And where someone used to be more cheerful and happy-go-lucky now has become more withdrawn, doesn't really want to hang out with people, is snapping at people, is you know speaking in monosyllables, whatever, that window of tolerance has shrunk drastically. Okay, so when somebody, I just want to make one quick note. So there are different ways in which we have to then work with them. Now, we might need to work with them to regulate their moods, regulate their impulses, regulate their reactions. What is causing them the anger? What is causing them? You know, maybe it's lack of social support. Maybe we have to mobilize that, whatever else it is. People who are lethargic, exhausted, I mean, you know, they're burnt out and so on. Uh, one thing is when somebody is in a hypo arousal state, Generally, it is better to avoid inward going practices like let's sit down and meditate together. Okay, because it's already a hypo arousal state. We don't want them to go further down. We want them to come out. So uh, we so you can look up uh, the window of tolerance theory and the framework, and you probably find a lot more interesting information there. Ashley, did I get it right? Do you have anything to add to it, to what I just said? Okay, all right. Okay, fine. So window of tolerance. Now, when you're attending to someone, assess which state they're in and please assess which state you're in. Okay, you're trying to help somebody who's here. You're also here. Not gonna help, friend. It's gonna get worse. If you're feeling really burnt out, exhausted and stuff, it's going to be really difficult for you to get somebody else back into their window of tolerance. Please be mindful of where you are before you engage with somebody who is already oscillating 
or is already in a hype, hyper arousal state or in a hypo arousal state. And this is why an interdisciplinary team becomes important. Person who has the energy and the mind space for it is the one who should be tackling it. Okay. Now, common illness related mental health conditions seen in palliative care. And I'm going to go through this very quickly. Uh, but this is just a sort of introduction to it. Those of you who are interested, there is plenty out there that you can do. So there is anxiety, there's complicated grief, depression, delirium, trauma. I am not going to talk to you about complicated grief today because uh, we have a separate section on grief and bereavement. Uh, and trauma, I will try and talk to you when I talk to you about grief and bereavement. We won't touch upon it because it's a, it's a very large topic. Uh, I'm going to talk to you today about primarily anxiety, depression, and a little bit about delivery. Um, anxiety, as we all know, is an intense, excessive, and persistent worry and fear about everyday situations. And it is normal when the situation is stressful. Suppose you're not a very comfortable public speaker and you have to go up on stage and deliver a speech. It's absolutely normal for you to feel anxiety. There's nothing wrong with that. In fact, it's it's a, it's a natural response, right? I feel a bit anxious before I have to set out on a, uh, if, if, if I'm going to be uh, going to the airport. And that's usually because I'm always late. So uh, I'm always a little bit anxious about leaving the house and making it to the airport on time. And, you know, so that th those kind of day-to-day -day anx anxiety stressors are normal. But this becomes problematic when you're anxious all the time the feelings are excessive, it's there about everything, things that didn't make you anxious earlier are making you anxious, it's interfering with your daily life, with your relationships, and now the episodes of anxiety are happening too frequently or with too much intensity, and you, and for some people, it's just not, there's no, there's no reason, there is no trigger, it's just a general state of being, it's not like something went wrong today and I'm anxious, I'm just anxious, so this is when it becomes pathological and problematic. Now, in palliative care specifically, anxiety may be associated with various things. Increased symptom burden. Yesterday, I was only, you know, I had a little bit of a tingling sensation in my foot. Today, I'm feeling nausea and I have a headache. Does this mean that the cancer has spread to my, to other parts of my body uh, today, you know? <clears throat> and I know that a lot, for a lot of, for a lot of patients, constipation changes in, bowel movement changes in appetite. These are all things that are causes for anxiety. If you have a serious diagnosis and there's something shifting in your body, something changing, people are anxious. Is this a new thing? Is this something I should be worried about? Even somebody who's in, who's in remission, you know, suddenly there's a persistent cough. Oh God, has it come back? Has it spread to my lungs? So increased symptom burden will be a cause of anxiety because people are wondering, why the symptom burden has increased. Medical procedures and interventions. How many of you here enjoy going to a dentist? My apologies to any dentist over here. Huh? Enjoy going to a dentist? You have a dental appointment next week. Are you really looking forward to it? Can't wait. Huh? <laughs> no. It's anxiety inducing, isn't it? Just that sound of that drill. Um, so medical procedures and interventions. So people with serious illnesses, it is a cause of anxiety because there, there is discomfort, there is pain. Maybe the technician is going to be rude. Maybe it's just also the indignity of having to, you know, maybe for some people to strip down in front of a stranger and have them probe them. Uh, colonoscopies, uh, you know, uh, fine needle, as, like, you know, FNAC for, like, for breast biopsies, things like that. It's very stressful. It's anxiety inducing. So that medical interventions and procedures in and of themselves can cause a lot of uh, anxiety in people. Okay. Um, decreased function on multiple domains, physical and cognitive. Now I need help to go to the toilet. Now I cannot sit up and change my clothes without help. Um, I'm becoming forgetful. Um, I've got, how many of you had brain fog after COVID? Any of you had brain fog? You know, where you couldn't think straight? It's a terrible, it, it's like a really awful experience. Need help to tie my hair. Yeah, so many things. People need help to wash my hair, need help to brush my teeth. 
uh, so any on any domain changes on multiple decreased function on multiple domains causes anxiety in people. Socioeconomic impact, of course. What are people going to say? I mean, I have a disfiguring cancer. I have cervical cancer, which is associated with reproductive uh, organs in a in a woman. Yeah, somebody has HIV. Some I forget all those illnesses. Even today, in today's day and age, tuberculosis is considered stigmatized. It's a stigma. It, it's a stigmatized illness. Yeah. So, so socially, there is an impact. Economically, there's an impact. Not being able to go to work, not being able the, the just the uh, uh, financial crisis that the family is now experiencing, loss of roles, loss, loss of autonomy. I'm now a patient. I used to be. I used to be the life of the party. I used to be the you know the fun one in the family. Today I'm just the patient. And hey, everyone makes decisions for. I can't make a single decision on my own without three people telling me whether it's okay or not. Why don't you check with the doctor? I don't think you should be doing that. Are you sure? So my autonomy and my ability to make decisions for myself is impacted and that causes me anxiety. I also, I might start second guessing my own judgment. Yeah. Information gaps and uncertainty. I mean, I should actually put this right on top because how many of you in this room have experienced anxiety because you don't have the information you needed? Yeah? And you ask questions, there are no answers. Then you go to Google and you find 10,000 answers, which are not answers that sound nice. Then you go back with those answers to the doctor and say, this is what Dr. Google said, and you get one scolding from this doctor. So there's huge information gaps. This is part and parcel of the way uh, a lot of the healthcare delivery is 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 uh, practiced, and I'm sorry you've experienced that, Rachel. I, and I'm pretty sure a lot of people have. And this lack of information. And see, the thing is, uh, if those of you who are counselors, you know, gestalt. Gestalt means uh, you know this the the whole is greater than the sum of its parts, which means also that humans have a tendency to fill in gaps. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put 10 dots horizontally. You guys are going to see a line. Correct? Okay. Uh, there are all these games you know, in the newspapers that, you know, so, so there is a tendency amongst in the human mind to make a whole picture even when there is gaps in information. If I don't have the information I need, I'm probably going to fill those gaps with my imagination, which might be worse. Okay. And that causes anxiety. Decision making and, and determining goals. Okay. So, doctor has said this is the condition. Here are your options. You can either do chemotherapy, eight rounds, followed by four fractions of radiation, and we'll see if we need to do surgery then. Or Madam, just do the hysterectomy right away and be done with it. You won't need all these other things. Stressful. Stressful making those choices, no? Okay. Now, determining goals. You have a very serious condition. It's unlikely that you're going to recover. What would you like to be able to do six months from now still? I don't want to be in a diaper that my family is changing. Okay. So we're going to make sure that we take care of you in a way that we don't come to that point. And even if it does, then maybe we can think of other ways in which we can manage it. Right? So, But, but these are all anxiety-inducing situations. Isolation, like some of you said, uh, see, no matter how much empathy we have for people who are not well, there is a sense of isolation and loneliness because they are the ones going through this. It is happening in their bodies. It's happening in their minds. And caregivers have their own sets of you know, issues and struggles. But the isolation of being the person in the family who is, who, is, who is unwell, that's one kind of isolation. The other kind of isolation is generally being isolated from other people because of the disease. Okay? Okay. Guilt is a big, big, big 
factor uh, that we see in advanced illnesses. Why? Why are we feeling guilty? Why should there be guilt? Why is guilt a big deal in palliative care? Amongst people receiving palliative care. We feel really bad about the people that we are causing pain and distress. But, yeah. And not being able to help ourselves. Yes. And a lot of people actually look at uh, diseases as though you're having a punishment uh, for something, something that you did. So you're having to go through so much of suffering. Yeah. So Karma. ultimately you start questioning yourself and maybe even hating yourself. Exactly. I'm seeing that, you know, a lot of you have put in very, very pertinent things in the chat box as well. So being a burden, causing the situation, not being able to take care of the family, religious thinking, yeah, guilt for what I'm doing. Oh, because of me and my treatment cost, my, you know, my, my, my wife has to give up X, Y, Z part of her lifestyle. My child cannot go to that college that he wanted to go to. No, all of those things. And that is very, very anxiety provoking. And in fact, these are the things that actually cause most amount of anxiety for a patient, more sometimes than the actual disease itself. Okay, so we have to, uh, we, ha we have to pay attention to this. And unfortunately, you know, when someone expresses this to us, one of the first things we say is, okay, don't think like that. Never in the history of humanity has someone stopped worrying just because you told them to stop worrying. No. So the thing is to sit to them and say, tell me more. Tell me why. Tell me why you feel like this. And how can I help reduce that burden? Okay. The last thing you need to say is don't think like that. This toxic positivity really needs to be gone. Have faith. Everything will become fine. No. That's not how it works. Okay. So sit down. Understand the guilt. And of course, future. What's going to happen? future about my children, my family, myself, and is it going to get worse? Am I going to uh, suffer more? What's going to happen? Is, uh, is the treatment going to work? Uh, you know, will things ever get better? Etc, etc, etc. Now, how does anxiety manifest? It manifests in all kinds of ways. It manifests physically. Uh, for many people, you know, it could be headaches, it could be insomnia, it could be stomach, it could be you know, breathing, it could be in the sex drive, it could be in blood sugar, whatever. Anxiety manifests in many, 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 many ways and uh, palpitations, things like that. So there are, there are physical manifestations to uh, anxiety. There's cognitive manifestations and I particularly like this, uh, this cartoon um, and because cognitively, you know, uh, anxiety will make us think the worst things. Okay. Um, racing, intrusive, recurring thoughts, negative, self-critical thoughts, recurrent images of harm, fearfulness, forgetfulness, difficulty making decisions, irritation, distraction, difficulty, concentration. These are all cognitive ways in which anxiety will manifest, which is different from physical anxiety. Okay. Anxiety person. Uh, so, um, and behavioral. Being anxious uh, can cause people to avoid, to, to take on avoidant behavior. They don't want to meet people. They avoid places, certain triggers, social situations, objects, activities. They might not make eye contact with you, things like that. People become avoidant. Some people develop compulsive habits. Like, you know, they, they become very, um, they constantly checking things, uh, ritualistic. They, they feel like they have to do the same thing over and over again as a sign of good luck. Um, hair nail biting, hair skin picking, you know, these are all compulsive things that they do in order to soothe their anxiety. And for a lot of people, it manifests in terms of like a clenched jaw, twitching, fidgeting. Uh, somebody who is not an extrovert suddenly, you know, being very extroverted. Um, perfectionism. Perfectionism is just another way of like trying to keep control. Because disease takes away control. Having a serious disease diagnosis takes away your control over life. So sometimes you might find that people have become perfectionists. They need everything to be exactly in a particular way. Otherwise, they get angry. Please understand that that is somebody trying to exert some level of control in their lives in a time when they have lost control. Okay? Rapid speech. 
people who normally uh, would speak a lot slower, suddenly they're speaking a lot faster, they're stumbling over their words. That could be a sign of anxiety, yeah? And when attempting to assess for anxiety in palliative care, especially, please, 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 before you go and call somebody you know, anxious, please make sure that they're not in pain, they're not experiencing delirium, if they're old, it's not, a, it's not dementia uh, manifesting. Please rule out substance use. See if any medications that they're taking might be causing them to have these palpitations or these symptoms of anxiety. And if the disease itself is worsening, sometimes breathlessness is a major source of anxiety, but breathlessness itself could be because the disease burden has increased. So don't be... Uh, make sure that you are checking for all these things when the person is unwell before you go and say, okay, this person has an anxiety disorder, okay? Now, how can anxiety be managed? First of all, information. Um, and like I said, information gaps are one of the biggest causes of stress and anxiety in our healthcare system at the, at, at the moment. So first of all, before you give information, you need to listen. What's bothering these people? Go back to the distress thermometer. I don't have money to buy my child's school books for the year. That is causing the person anxiety. Not the fact that they found one more site where the cancer has spread. Main source of anxiety at the moment is that I don't have money to buy school books for my child. Not that I'm not worried about the metastasis, but so listen, first of all, listen, understand. And if you're meeting them for the first time, understand what they know about their illness. We, especially in our country, have a terrible, uh, you know, collusion sort of uh, atmosphere where, no, don't tell the patient, don't tell the patient, don't tell the patient. Why don't tell the patient? Because the patient will not be able to bear it or will not be able to uh, cope. Well, the patient has the illness. I'm not saying that every patient has to be told. It really depends case to case, but understand what the patient and the family know about the disease. What do they understand of what they know? Okay, what does this mean? I know that I have interstitial lung disease. I know, I know the name of my condition. Interstitial lung disease means? I don't know, it's, it's just some disease of the lungs. So I might know the name of the disease. I might know some medical jargon, but do I understand it? Do I understand what that means to have interstitial lung disease? Do I understand what multiple sclerosis is? Do I understand what, so, so please, so don't, ah, patient knows, patient knows they have ILD. Yes, but does the patient understand what ILD is going to mean in terms of lifestyle changes, in terms of, you know, treatment trajectory and so on? Understand that. Elicit unstated fears or worries. Okay, so um, Mrs. Khanna, you have, you have just told me that you have ILD and that you understand that it is a progressive disease of the lungs. Okay. You want to tell me how it's been for you so far? Is there anything particularly that is worrying you or that you want to talk about? It doesn't necessarily have to be something specific to the disease, but anything else? Have there been other changes in your life that you want to talk to me about right now that I can, you know, that that, that will help me understand where you're at? Okay. Medical anxiety versus death anxiety. What does this mean? Okay. Um... Let's spend a few minutes on this. I'm just keeping track of time. Um, what is medical anxiety versus death anxiety? Medical anxiety could be something that is just about the, the, the diagnostic. And uh, the other one is like, you know that you are proceeding and it's like the path has started. So that anxiety is there. Okay. So there's a difference between the two. One, there is a scope to recover back. How you'll be doing it is one thing. There, there's more chance of losing hope. So would you, okay, 
what is the reason most people will give you for not telling the patient about the seriousness of the disease? I missed that. Sorry. I said, um, and this is a question to everybody. When families tell you, please don't tell the patient that they have the serious illness, what are they trying to protect? Uh, they are trying to protect that, uh, that happiness zone that that person is in. They don't want him to just, him or her to just come out from there because of one news that has been broken to them. So they would like to probably hide it. They don't know how th that person will react. Maybe that person may not react that badly. They may take it on a good platter, but it is just their way of looking, their biases that come on, their subjectiveness in judging the person that comes in. Okay, thank you. She needs his hope and uh, yeah, protecting hope. Want them to die calmly and happily. Okay. It it's funny no? that uh, we think that by not knowing, we're doing them a favor, by not telling them. Um, maybe in some cases it might be true. But please understand that it's not, nobody has asked the patient whether they want to know or not. This is the fear of the caregiver that you are seeing, not the fear of the patient. They will tell you it's the fear of the patient. It's actually the fear of the caregiver. Don't tell them because they cannot handle it. What makes you say they cannot handle it? This is a person who was the head of your family for the last 50 years. He's handled a lot. What makes you think this news he can't handle? No, 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 he's afraid of dying. Now, uh, coming back to uh, death anxiety is not hypochondriasis. Um, here's the thing. Uh, we assume in a lot of cases that people are afraid of death. That might be true for a lot of people. But, and this is anecdotal experience and evidence from my side, as I get into end of life conversations with a lot of people, I find that it's not death that they're scared of, they are scared of how it is going to happen. Am I going to suffocate? Am I going to bleed out? Am I going to lose my mind? Am I going to lose control over my, over my, uh, you know, am I going to become incontinent? Am I going to die completely without dignity? How is it going to happen? That's medical anxiety. Don't confuse medical anxiety with death anxiety. Okay. Yes, there are people who are afraid of dying, but then if you get into the conversation with them, it's usually the process and the fear of suffering that is driving that anxiety. So please learn to make that distinction in your mind. And it is a, it's a skill you're going to pick up as you practice it. Okay. So when somebody says they are scared, what are they scared of? They are scared of dying. Have you asked them that question? No, I don't need, I know, I know my father. Have you had this conversation? Let me help you have that conversation with your dad. So I'll give you an example. Recently, um, when my mother was sick, um, so the, the opening came like this, you know, she told me about some dream she had and, um, where she felt that uh, my grandmother was calling her. And so I asked her, I said, so what does that dream mean to you? And she said, I think my time has come. So had I not been in palliative care, I think my answer to her would have been, I don't talk like that. But instead I said, so what do you make of it? And she said, well, I don't know, I'm scared. So I asked her, I said, what are you scared of? And uh, she said, I don't want to die how, how Nani died because my grandmother died of, a, of COPD. So I said, tell me what that was like. And so she said, no, she suffocated. She was constantly short on breath and this and that. So I said, mama, what is the difference right now? She said, what do you mean? So I said, Nani died 20 years ago. You are here now. Yes, you both have a lung condition. What is the difference? She said, well, we didn't have concentrators. We didn't have cylinders. We didn't have morphine. We didn't have doctors on call. There is a difference. So what we actually tackled in that moment was her medical anxiety. And I actually had the opportunity to tell her, we will make sure that you won't suffer. I didn't say you're not going to die. So there is a, you can actually address somebody's fear realistically. And you're not taking away hope. Actually, the person's hope is for not to suffer. Okay. So 
please understand that these conversations can sound like they're very very difficult to have but they're not it's about you in that moment stepping forward and saying to them tell me what is what what are you afraid of nine out of 10 times they'll tell you i'm scared of suffering why what makes you think that you'll get the answer and then if you are well informed enough you will say we have medication we have teams we have people who will who who will make sure that you don't have you don't go through that okay so that's how medical anxiety and death anxiety are different and they are very it's a very very important distinction to make especially when you're dealing with collusion in families where families are telling you please don't tell this person etc etc okay goal setting short term medium this is important okay fine a lot of people say how much time do i have now my my response to that would be what is it that you would like to do that will give you the clue okay and say okay you know what we're doing this therapy let's see uh, you're doing physiotherapy let's see by next week if you're able to you know walk with the help of a walker let's aim for that it's possible um medium term goals yeah i'd like to go to the temple for a pilgrimage okay let's get you to walk use that walker do physiotherapy and then maybe by next month we can you know transfer you to a car and take you to the temple long term goals now this is a tough one i want to be there to see my daughter getting married daughter is 2 years old now <laughs> it's not going to happen <laughs> okay but uh so but then we focus then on the short and mid term goals okay all right problem solving through shared decision making giving them the autonomy back saying tell me this is the this is the disease you have this is the treatment options available this is how much it will cost you these are the lifestyle changes you need to make etc etc so what is what works for you okay so problem solving through shared decision making okay um i think you should get an air bed because that will help prevent pressure sores um okay but does an air bed require you know does it require a power line of its own yes it does okay so then i need to do that you know it comes down to these small 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 decisions which ultimately go towards the bigger decisions and of course there are the bigger decisions as well should i be having the surgery laying out the pros and cons laying out what the after care looks like do you have care caregivers do you have social support do you have people who can come and help out with the kids etc etc that shared decision making that allows a person to be able to make the decisions that they need to make okay restoring a sense of control by doing all of these things by listening to them by getting their fears by telling talking to them about medical anxiety by helping them set goals realistic goals helping them solve problems etc etc i am giving them back a sense of control and that will bring their anxiety levels down okay okay restoring a sense of safety now i've got a disease diagnosis that has really shattered my world because now i'm threatened i have a life threatening disease i don't know when i'm going to am i going to drop dead am i going to be able to secure my finances so that my family doesn't suffer after i go i'm feeling very unsafe at the moment now first of all understand what safety means to them don't assume what can i do to help you right now feel a little bit safer to make you feel like you're in competent hands okay assure them of care i'm here for you and if there is something that i cannot do i will try and find somebody like for example why do we have a multidisciplinary team why do we have why do we have medical social workers why do we have counselors it's because they are the people who will also take care of certain social economic and psychosocial issues whether it is logistics whether it is financial whether it is you know education support for the children i you're giving me free uh, free medicine from palium india but hey i don't have much i don't have food there are about 100 odd families in palium india who being supported with food kits what's the what's the point of getting free medication if you don't have any food to eat so assurance of care yeah that i am not here just to manage your pain i'm going to try and mitigate all your serious health related stuff identifying social support and that is something that our medical social workers do extremely well find and mobilize people in the community who will offer that support also to the family access to caregivers and he and uh, healthcare teams um whether this is through home care services linking them to doctors and nurses who have home care services linking them to asha workers linking them to 
uh, tried and tested palliative care services in their area, so on and so forth. Okay. Frequent clarifying conversations. This is important. Please note that having a conversation once is not going to fully register. This is a volatile emotional time in a person's life when they are sick. You might have to repeat information. They might have the same questions over and over again. It's not because they're not paying attention to you. It's not because of any. You might have to check your language. Are they understanding your language? Are you using too much medical jargon? Okay. Try and use simple language that is understandable in their context. How I, how I speak to somebody from, uh, say, an educated upper middle class background might be very different from what the language I employ when I talk to somebody who is not from that socioeconomic bracket. Um, somebody who is older, somebody who is younger, I might have to repeat information according to what their needs are. Involve them in the goals of care. I'm not going to make decisions for you. I'm going to invite you to help me make the right uh, call and the decision is yours. Okay. So, and sometimes they make decisions that you don't like. But you've got to respect it because that's autonomy. Okay. And before anything else, please, please, please make sure that physical symptoms are being controlled uh, through medication and through other ways. Okay. Insomnia, fatigue, breathlessness, pain relief. Uh, all of these things have to be managed and then you will see the anxiety levels coming down. So you cannot work in a silo and as a counselor, I'm going and giving 10, 10 sessions on therapy, you know, therapy sessions on anxiety when actually there is something else going on. So make sure that there is appropriate ad adequate symptom control and then that adds to the entire picture and you're able to manage the anxiety better. And how do you communicate with someone with anxiety? Uh, you have to reassure them that it's common, it's normal, acknowledge their feelings, but don't judge them, don't minimize, don't worry, it's going to be fine, don't say that, please don't say that. Understand that what to them is a big problem may not be a big problem to you, okay, but to them it is the biggest problem in their life right now. Ask open-ended questions, you've done a session on communication, so I'm not going to belabor this point. Allow pauses in conversations without rushing to fill them in. People with anxiety have to gather their thoughts. They're not always able to do that immediately. Silence is an incredibly powerful tool. Use it. Repeat or rephrase what the person told you to show that you have understood what they're saying. People with anxiety may not be able to articulate themselves very clearly in that moment. So always rephrase, reframe, repeat. Did I understand you correctly when you said this? That you are actually most worried at this point about getting you know, funding for your children's books so that they can go to school. Is that your primary concern at the moment? Is that what I'm hearing? Okay. Um, use everyday language. Like I just said, please don't use medical terms. Um, provide information on the person's preferred language and format. Uh, it takes time to build a trusting relationship. Just because you're wearing a white coat does not mean they're going to trust you and open up to you. Uh, ask them how their anxiety affects them and what makes them feel better. Okay, my anxiety doesn't let me sleep. Okay, so when you can't sleep, what do you do sometimes that actually helps? Ask them how you can help when they're anxious. Okay, would you like me to be quiet with you for some time? Am I asking you too many questions? Do you want to just gather your thoughts a little bit? Make sure your, your voice is calm and even. Okay, and don't pressurize it. I think you have to do yoga once a month and once a week and you have to to do brain exercises you have to no please don't pressurize them to do any of that stuff please don't you can suggest it okay uh very quickly we're going to just talk about depression it's a very common mental disorder characterized by persistent sadness lack of interest or pleasure it has uh, impact on your sleep and appetite and tiredness and poor concentration also are common. So it affects you emotionally, uh, behaviorally, physically, and also in terms of cognition. And this is a WHO definition of depression. Okay. And it is very common in palliative care populations. Uh, it can range anywhere between 24% to 70%, depending on the kind of disease the person has, whether it's cancer, whether it's heart disease, whether it's progressive neurological conditions, etc. Uh, depression itself leads to decreased quality of life, 
it may lead to suicidal ideation, and it is associated with increased pain and fatigue, reduced treatment compliance, poorer prognosis, higher mortality. So it's a catch-22 situation. Depression can make things worse. The disease can make the depression worse. The depression can make the disease worse. Good palliative care itself is a great strategy for preventing depression at the end of life. Okay, so palliative care in and of itself is one of the best interventions you can bring, which means good symptom control, psychosocial support, spiritual support, eliciting fears, all of those things that we do in palliative care in and of it themselves are good antidotes to depression at this point in time. Now, you have to understand there's a difference between grief and depression. I will not, Senior, I have not done grief and bereavement for this group yet, have I? Uh, no, ma'am. So I'm not going to spend too much time here because we uh, I'll share these slides with you. But when we talk about grief, we will also talk about the difference between grief and depression. And um, and uh, one of the main things is that when you're grieving, you're still able to maintain connections with other people. You might be able to experience you know moments of uh, pleasure and uh, engage in activities that you like. Depression, that's not possible. So. Uh, we'll spend more time on it when we talk about grief and depression and the difference between them. Okay. And diagnostic challenges in uh, palliative care. It's difficult sometimes to diagnose whether a person has depression or not. Uh, sometimes it's underdiagnosed because, well, you have a serious illness. Of course, it's normal for you to feel sad and, uh, you know, disconnected. So, it's part of it's like, it's like it's been very recently, uh, pain was considered to be a normal part of having a serious illness, so we don't treat for pain. So, um, so it, sometimes it goes underdiagnosed, sometimes it is misdiagnosed, okay, because things like hypoactive delirium, grief, poorly controlled pain can manifest in ways that can be misdiagnosed as depression, okay. And unfortunately, then what happens is people are given antidepressants when actually the problem is something else and it can complicate the issue. So, so it can be underdiagnosed, it can be misdiagnosed. And there are quite a few medications themselves that cause symptoms that are depression-like, okay? And can induce depression also. So, I mean, these are just some, some medicines, but I mean, you'll have to talk to the doctors in your team to understand. So. This is again why an interdisciplinary uh, approach is very important because there are actually uh, medications that can cause depression or symptoms of depression. Okay. And lack of energy change in appetite and body weight, which are very typical of depression, um, could also just be because of the disease itself. Because the disease is progressing, there, there is a change in sleep uh, patterns, there's a change in appetite, body weight, etc etc so it may just be the disease itself and not depression and sometimes a lot of the time we do not have skilled practitioners who can go in there and actually diagnose depression and then offer the support okay and so sometimes people are like you know what let me just take care of the pain and the nausea i don't know about this depression thing you know maybe if i take care of the pain and the nausea then the depression will take care of its so there is, for those of you who are counselors, please join palliative care teams because we really need you. And uh, uh, interdisciplinary teams across the country really could do with more psychologists and counselors joining them. Okay, now diagnostic best practice, you have to interview the person. Um, you have to assess the severity of the symptoms, duration, the amount of impairment, their past psychiatric history. What other alternative diagnoses could that be? And I've, I've just taken you through some of them. It could be the disease. It could be the medication. It could be various other things. What are the contributory factors? And please go by validated techniques, the ICD-10, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. Use validated assessment scales. Please don't go and just say, I had a conversation with this person and I think this person is depressed. No, please do it as per a validated tool. And uh, if in doubt, please treat. Okay. Um, Okay, we have 10 minutes. Uh, uh, you have to screen for delirium. Delirium is another mental health issue can, uh, 
uh, connected with palliative care patients in some cases. Uh, and this could be because of metastases, you know, uh, brain metastases. It could be because of various reasons. It could be because of uh, electrolyte imbalances and so on. Uh, and if there's any evidence of acute or sudden change in mental status, confusion, disorientation, hallucination, delusion, uh, from what the person normally is, uh, please check for that. Uh, has this person suddenly had difficulty focusing attention, for example, being easily distracted or having difficulty keeping track of what is being said? I, can you repeat that? I didn't understand it. I, I didn't catch you. I, can you say it again? If that is not normal for the person, if they're not, you know, impaired in other ways, then please screen for delirium. Is the person's thinking disorganized and incoherent? Are they rambling? Are they contradicting themselves? Is there an illogical flow of ideas? And the fourth is overall, is the person's level of consciousness anything but alert? Just regular alert is one thing, but hypervigilant, uh, you know, overly sensitive to light, to sound, very easily startled, or they're lethargic, or they're not easily woken up. It could be anything, anything that is not normal alertness. So yes to one and two, and either three or four is a positive screen for delirium. So please uh, go through the slide and uh, you'll have to bring in somebody who can understand. There will have to be a medical doctor involved when there is delirium because it could be any number of reasons that the person is delirious. Okay, uh, screening for depression. Uh, during the past month, have you often been bothered by feeling down, depressed, hopeless? During the past month, have you often been bothered by little interest or pleasure in doing things? Yes, to either question is considered a positive screen to get you started. This does not mean that the person is absolutely depressed. This is a starting point for you. Okay. Um, uh, for those of you who are psychologists and counselors, you're familiar with this. For those of you who are not, uh, well, you will have to rely on a psychologist or counselor or a therapist to uh, participate in these interventions. Uh, CBT helps in palliative care. I personally find CBT a little mechanistic and I prefer a more humanistic, uh, you know, narrative therapy and things like that. Uh, but CBT can be very effective in certain cases. Group therapy does help. Uh, couples therapy, especially when, uh, you know, for example, when there's spinal cord trauma and one of the spouses is in a wheelchair, it has affected the intimate life, it has affected those kind of things, couples therapy becomes very important and it is severely underdone in, in India. Support of psychotherapy, of course, uh, from counselors, but even just barefoot counseling that is done by, by social workers is very, very helpful. Okay, I'm not going to go into ACEs at the moment because uh, we can do that another time. I'm just gonna stop with this and um, we have five, six minutes. So. Does anybody have any particular questions or reflections, observations? You Anything? mentioned uh, barefoot counseling by social. Can you just give some uh, one or two, a little uh, more detail on that? There's, there's actually a whole school of thought called uh, barefoot counseling. Uh, please look it up. Um, and it, basically the idea is that, see, not everybody is going to have the training uh, of a psychologist. But there is, we call them barefoot techniques where you don't have to be, you know, super trained in like REBT, CBT, et cetera. But these are your basic skills and how do you establish rapport? How do you have difficult conversations? Things like that. So look up barefoot counseling. You'll find quite a bit there. Mind India in uh, Gohati, run by Dr. Sangeeta Goswami. They do a lot of barefoot counseling courses as well. So please look them up. Um, and Dr. Sangeeta Goswami is an incredible uh, facilitator. So uh, barefoot counseling, um, it started off, I think it was, uh, I forget, I think it was um, a Christian priest who started doing this in rural parts of India, but then it has grown into a whole school of thought. And it's, uh, it's, it's just useful for people who are not officially trained as psychologists. It's, please, it's not a, it's not a replacement uh, for extensive training in psychotherapy and psychology. Uh, so, but it will give you some of the more basic fundamentals. Okay. Uh,
you used another term um, supportive psychotherapy the last slide which had the group therapy uh, can you throw some light on that something very short crisp how uh, does it differ from group therapy A group also will be having like people coming together and talking no individual this individual counseling individual one on one one on one do any of you have any experiences that you want to share about when you were able to probably help with anxiety or depression or any of these other issues not necessarily in a palliative care setting but i'd really love to hear from people what you know something that worked maybe working with teenagers in counseling because they do have a lot of anxiety so uh, there was this one on one kind of a thing that we were doing with one of the client who was having suicidal tendencies she still has them but it has largely reduced after going through the counseling sessions and also using of expressive art therapies in a group setting it helps so just had some couple of those experiences thought of sharing thank you anybody else Ah, okay. Climbing. Yeah, physical activity can actually really uh, be a great. Uh, I think because of all the endorphins and serotonin and all of that, that can be a that can be really really useful. Are you based in Bangalore, Ashley? Ashley, you are muted. Bombay. Okay. uh art based therapy and activities yeah that can be really and especially also for children because uh, children are not able to articulate themselves yeah um so art based therapy creative arts therapy things like that really go a long way with children with pre, with, with and with adults i'll tell you that so um so those are those are great ways to link up and to to help um with with people who are um, i mean i think with people who are facing serious illness um some of these things may not be possible because they just don't have the energy for it okay rachel i know you and you're no oldie so uh, painting helps a lot yeah <laughs> painting does help a lot and um i think you, yeah the we find that you know you don't necessarily have to be um somebody who's done it before or whatever it's something that you can try for the first time it's activating a different part of your brain that really also helps rewire and reprogram it yeah okay so we are at the top of the hour um it's been a very quiet group today which worries me for many reasons but uh, if you have any questions or any other reflections you can always uh, get in touch with senia and she will pass them on to me and uh, i hope to have a uh, yeah. the question uh, i have asked them for the previous speakers also you have a point which in which you have mentioned that the uh, the caretakers hiding it from the uh, patient about the illness mm. so probably in a, a person who is not since you are also talking about the mental status uh, mental health status somebody with the dementia somebody who doesn't know the current is not in the current time so telling him or not telling him does not make a difference or does it because he will anyways forget not be able to tangibly handle it or there you have to like there's no point in telling or you have a different answers for that there is no compulsion that every patient has to be told that's not the thumb rule that every patient before they die have to know that they have this disease and they die no um there are people who just don't want to know and you have to respect it there are people like you mentioned who may not even be able to grasp it 
there are people for whom it might actually cause a lot of distress and they prefer not to know so it is a very case to case thing there is no rule that every patient in your care has to be told the truth and that is i think we need to really do away with that idea collusion why we want to break collusion is because it's unhealthy for the family itself and collusion is giving you an opportunity to understand what the family's fears are why are they gatekeeping okay you use the word collusion have you collusion. used that before that's the word collusion means when two people conspire to not tell a third person okay thank you that collusion is one of the most common things we see in palliative care or in any serious illness where the family will tell the doctor or the or the healthcare team please don't tell the patient their diagnosis it's called collusion the word for that is collusion and uh, there's a lot of literature about, about collusion out there um and like i said it's not necessary that you have to break collusion to the patient but if collusion exists that is a sign for you to work with the family the family is in distress that's why they're asking you to do that okay thanks for that question thank you Sinha Yes ma'am I'm up we can wind up Thank you everybody thank you everyone for joining us today thank you ma'am for that wonderful session uh if you are having more questions please share it share it with me uh, i will help you with that i will share the questions with you ma'am so uh, thank you all for joining us today i'll be sharing the feedback link in your whatsapp group thank you all bye bye we'll see you on the next session on friday bye